He's going to read a couple of pages from his novel, his new novel, and this is going to skip. Very old novel. New to me. New to me. A boat, a nice in the cast. Good man, if you wish to please maintain your silence for Dickie Burke. Good man. Oh, Dickie. Wonderful. Coming after the two that have just been before me, I'm afraid that you're going downhill all the way. Uh, this is a novel I wrote some years ago about a guy who comes back to Galway for the races after spending seven years in England. Um, he has a week and on the last night he and his friends and his newly found girlfriend uh, are just about to break up. They've been drinking in DJ Lydon's. DJ Lydon's is now known as the Key, <coughs> but it was known as DJ Lydon in those days to all of us. It's like, uh, and I'd like to read this little excerpt from mine. <coughs> At his elbow, Catherine sat silently and looked into her now empty glass. She hadn't spoken since she had finished her song and didn't know what to say to Martin to ease his pain. In the end, it was he who spoke. Hey, fellas, I've just realised that Catherine here has never been to Gaul, it was only nightclub, the Casa. <laughs> the what? She asked in puzzlement. The Casa! chorus the lads together and started to laugh. The ice was broken. Across the street, almost exactly opposite Hickey's Fish and Chip Shop, and not more than 30 or 40 feet up the road from Delia's pub, was a late night eating house run by two sisters, the famous Nora and Dilly. It was not by any manner of means by way of being luxurious or even comfortable. It was one room, a large grotty kitchen with a large iron range at the end upon which stood a giant saucepan which boiled and bubbled continuously and which contained the soup. <laughs> to call it soup was to do it a great kindness. <laughs> For it varied in viscosity from pain on the top called drinking soup to leaden at the bottom, the famous eight soup. In one corner of the kitchen, the managing director of the great pair made chips and boiled crew beans. While her sister, from the humour Tucker, would play the accordion or recite long remembered favourite poems from the school primer, as uh, she used to call it primer, that she had learned and loved when the Boer War was at its bottom. The rough wooden tables were scrubbed clean once a day uh, and carried fresh newspapers as tablecloths. It was a premises much frequented by more literary minded senior students, foreign sailors, and above all, medical students, who in order to gain admission, styled themselves doctor when asked at the door, who was outside. It was this letterbox now that the troop arrived, and Martin and Michael presented themselves in front of it, while the rest hid against the wall. Nora didn't care for large crowds that she couldn't handle, although a cut from her sharp tongue was as effective as any whip. The letterbox had been enlarged so that Krubins or even a bag of chips might have passed through once the money had been paid by some hungry but undesirable client to whom she would refuse to open the door. From behind the letterbox now came the challenge, who's out? Doctors McDonough and Jordan. <laughs> there was a rattle and a small squeak and the letterbox opened in much, uh, excuse me, opened an inch. A sharp pair of eyes regarded them through the slit has ye drink taken? Only supper. <laughs> the letterbox closed again, and there was a sound from behind the door as the great iron bar that held it closed was raised and put to one side. The door cracked open as she stood with her body blocking the way until she was sure they should be let in. Oh, it's ye, is it? She said, recognizing Michael first. It is ma'am, said Martin, respectively. <laughs> And we're, we have another couple or two with us. Is it all right to bring them in? As long as there's no drunk fellas there. A lot of drunks to be coming here trying to get in, pretending that we know them. And would we let them in for chips? And they'd be inside all night and wouldn't go. Oh no, we don't let any drunk fellas in here at home. <laughs> this was more or less the standard entrance speech. And having given it, she stood aside and let them in. There were seven of them, and they filed quietly past her into the yellow light of the kitchen, or inner sanctum. Martin led the way, enjoying Kathleen's goggle-eyed look 
when she saw where they were. Mike followed with Johnny, Johnny O and Timmy, who was well and truly drunk at this stage, but was still more or less mobile. Richie and Patney brought up the rear, both of whom were fairly well known to the management. Dado hadn't come, that's besides the point. When they were inside, they found a table near the stairs and installed themselves. Deline came down and spread a fresh newspaper on the table and laid knives and forks in each place before taking their order. I have a nice bit of place now if any of like some, she said, the way of presenting the menu. And all but Michael decided that they would have place and chips, while he opted for a bowl of eight and soup. The other tables were occupied by a mixed clientele, which ranged from two well-known doctors and a handful of teachers to a couple of actors from the local Gaelic theatre at the Tiger. Also, a single forlorn Dutch sailor who spoke no understandable language, but who nevertheless had succeeded in ordering true beans and chips, which he was demolishing now with gusto, and not a little style. When they had been served, he asked a smaller of the two ladies to give them a song, but she protested that she had a touch of the brannicles and would say instead a poem, the Cladabo, which she did. With another bit of encouragement, she took the accordion down from the top of the dresser and played them some marching tunes. To everybody's amazement, the Dutch sailor joined in and sang one of the songs in Dutch, an act which gained him the instant acceptance and applause from the crowd. He smiled warmly and went back to dismembering his crew beans. They tried to get Kathleen to sing another song, but she begged off saying that the last time she had sung there had nearly been a row and she wouldn't like to risk it in here in such respectable company. When they had finished and were leaving, Nora, who was holding the door open to them, said to Martin that she had been in school with his aunt Fanny and his mother as well, <laughs> and that they were grand girls, the two of them. Lord have mercy on them both. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That was lovely. out that uh, the reason that the piece is in it is because uh, both of the girls were in school with my grandmother and my grandmother died when she was in her 30s and so I never had any problem getting in because when I went to the door I would say, she would say who's out? I said Dickie Burton, come in, come in, uh, poor Willie, God bless her, we thought she was a lovely girl and she died too young and I was in. Sometimes I think she confused me with my father, who was also Dickie Burton, but that didn't matter. I was here. Thank you very much. <laughs>